Hi and welcome to the Homeopathy Health Show. I'm Atik Ahmad Bharti, a fourth generation homeopath with over 25 years of professional experience and practice in this field of healing. The Homeopathy Health Show is the online voice of homeopathy around the world, promoting and raising awareness of this truly unique system of healing, which is suitable for all ages, young and old. Every week I invite guests from the world of homeopathy to come and share their experiences, their work, offer insights and essentially talk all things homeopathy. Why not visit www.liketreatslike.co.uk and click on the radio and podcast button to listen to the latest episodes. So let's begin today's show here on UK Health Radio, the world's number one talk health radio. Hi and welcome to another episode of the Homeopathy Health Show here on the UK Health Radio Network. I do hope you're well and of course I hope it remains that way. Now you may remember that in episode 38 of the show I had the good fortune to uh, speak to Elizabeth Adalian and she's a practicing homeopath with over 30 years of experience in the field. Elizabeth has taught homeopathy in the UK and in different countries around the world and um, Interestingly enough, um, she has collaborated with Dr. Nigel Hargreaves, who has a background in engineering, climate change and sustainability, and has carried out research on energy systems for his PhD. Now, both Nigel and Elizabeth are joining me on today's uh, episode of the Homeopathy Health Show to talk about their new book, which they've co-authored, which is called Flourishing Against the Odds, Homeopathy for a Rapidly Changing World. And um, just as a backstory, uh, Nigel met Elizabeth in the 1980s after working in Asia and Africa and benefited from her life-saving treatment with homeopathy from an illness that he had developed. His career in homeopathy started in 1990, uh, or in the 1990s rather, at the London School of Homeopathy, where he studied for his uh, licence and later started a practice focused on helping people recover from drug and alcohol addiction. Now, more importantly, working in the fields of energy decarbonization and environmental regeneration, Nigel believes homeopathy has a critical role to play in building mental, emotional and physical disease resilience as we face increasingly threatening and complex global challenges. So I'm absolutely delighted to have both uh, my wonderful friend Elizabeth Adalian and uh, my new friend, I hope, Dr. Nigel Hargreaves. Um, and I welcome you both to the show. Thank you. Thank, thank you, Ati. So do tell me um, about this collaboration and what led the, towards the development of, of this book, which I feel is so, so important for the time we are living in. And of course, I've just covered some of the reasons why, but it's so such a sensitive time that we're in uh, but we're going to go into more detail but so let's start at you know why and and how this emerged who do you want to talk first elizabeth yes well i have to admit that as nigel has already hinted i don't know much about technology so although obviously a lot of my work is out there it was very often Nigel, who's my helper behind the scenes on that score. And um, after writing various articles around the time of the pandemic, he suddenly turned around to me and said, you know, they're wasted on your website. And um, with my skill and my interest in climate change, there's such an overlap. Have you thought we could put a book together? And because we go back a long time as friends and colleagues, I thought, well, we know each other well enough to trust that we could do this. And it's um, been a remarkable experience, I think. Would you agree, Nigel, for both of us? Yeah, indeed. Um, but, you know, when you're doing something like this, you get the times when you feel like you wish you never suggested it. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> now that it's over, uh, well, I say it's over, now Now that the book's published, uh, which is what I mean, um, I feel like uh, quite pleased with the achievement that we've had in such a collaboration. I think it's um, it's it's a unique collaboration because uh, of what 
you are focusing on in the book itself and there's there's a number of things which include i mean the base could you say the base is very much to do with trauma so um to do with wars toxic environmental pollution a covid pandemic the mental emotional fallout from lockdowns and so forth in fact you know you mentioned wars the toxicity you know from wars is huge and on on a separate note here also the fact that we talk about climate change and oh this is happening to the planet and that's happening the amount of carbon that's go, that goes into the atmosphere as a result of the wars going on is absolutely immense and yet nobody talks about that everybody talks about industry and you know um motor vehicles and and things perhaps that we can rely on but nobody actually goes in and says well hang on a minute it's also this and this is actually one of the worst things that can happen which is causing so much problem for the planet and for people but anyway i digress right um but going back to to trauma and this and this book do tell us some of the the areas that you've covered um and and what the reasoning was behind that can i say um bringing it back to samuel hanuman because i think people may think that this is very cutting edge but what's it got to do with basic homeopathy we bring the theme back always to the organon and to samuel hanuman and um, the vital force which is still uppermost for us but we see what's going on out there as what we call traumatization rather than trauma feeding into the original trauma but actually what's happening out there is almost like our new maintaining cause or causes and i think this is why we entitled the book flourishing against the odds because there's a lot of languishing that goes on because the powers out there are not allowing for us to flourish anymore it's down to us and what's so beautiful about homeopathy is that we can actually navigate our own course of health despite all these impacts I think that's really what made us write this book that we still felt optimistic that we could achieve this if we could lay down that road map between us. You know that's so beautifully said Elizabeth because I always say there is real real hope in homeopathy and I absolutely agree with you you know the way that it is is everything is becoming very restricted and it has to be one way or the highway as far as how we live our lives. and yet there is this freedom that you can actually live your life the way that you want it uh, and certainly homeopathy is a, a means to that as far as one's well-being is concerned mental emotional physical um what what's your uh, what's your take on that nigel yeah i'd second that i mean elizabeth's treatment has really helped me in, in my life to recover from tropical illnesses that i encountered but i think in in terms of the book itself um what i thought was as i was helping elizabeth publish her articles on her website that there was a body of information here that we could uh, arrange in such a way that it focused on wider issues than what's happened in the past but also prepare uh people for the future as a climate scientist i know that uh um we're only seeing the early effects of the baked in impacts that will come from global warming and so what what would be a, a very useful thing would be to equip people with tools that they can build their resilience to the illnesses that will come as a result of uh famine or flooding or forest fires sea level rise all these kinds of things which are on their way in 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 more more and more uh devastating forms and you mentioned war and carbon that's only part of it the social foundation that we have built in our societies around the world will be under threat as a result of all these environmental impacts and what i saw was really necessary was to convey a message of reconnection if we reconnect to ourselves then we can reconnect better to each other and as we reconnect in that way we can re- reconnect to the environment around us that we have somehow damaged to such an extent i think primarily through a lack of reconnection so homeopathy for me in that respect 
is a means to reconnection. Reconnection think, with the vital force. I think connection, connection is a key word, isn't it? To ourselves, to the planet, to each other. And I think one of the issues of COVID is it, it did divide us and it did cause deep division, even to the point of derision within families, within communities. And I feel that that's carried on into other situations. For example, the war, you're either with this side or you're with that side. Mm. And that duality is becoming worse and worse, that polarisation. And I think that's another aspect that we've really tried to tackle within ourselves through treatment and through the greater sphere. Yeah. If, if a miasma was a was a, 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 a an energetic holding pattern, then if there were, ever was a new miasma out there, it would be one of disconnection, which, as Elizabeth alludes to, was made worse by the lockdowns, by the isolation that people encountered. But also, I think we have been contributing to in other ways in, in, in terms of our con life form consumption and uh, polarization through social media and all the things that we actually mention in the book have, have actually contributed to the disconnection that we're feeling now. I think also if I may add to that, that certain remedies we emphasize in the book were remedies we used to read about and look at and think, gosh, people really feel like that? Whereas now those remedies are becoming more and more polycress. Remedies like plutonium, helleborus, picric acid, very deep and very dark remedies are now more mainstream. So this is why we have one chapter called Redeploying Homeopathy. I mean, that's quite a radical term, but in fact, we are re redeploying homeopathy to match this new challenge on so many levels i think it's you know with what you've just both said i think this book is an absolute gem it's so so timely so firstly congratulations because honestly just by what you've said um it makes so much sense how are we going to move forward you know how with everything that's going on with everything you've just said about the world the planet that we live on earth and what we're surrounded by and what we've gone through. And to be able to have homeopathy there by your side as a means to progress, as a means to, to be perfectly honest with you, as a means to just carry on, okay? To live, to continue to live. Because even living is a challenge, is it not, in many parts of the world, you know? And it's not just the environment and it's not just you know dare i say it, governments and and you know social disorder and and so many other things that are taking place it's just that inner peace but i i wanted to just go back slightly because you mentioned the lockdowns um so many people now seem to be suffering from um anxiety anxiety attacks you know panic attacks basically being nervous for no reason whatsoever. And this is being nervous even with the people they live in within the four walls of their own home. I mean, what's your, what's your sort of insight onto what's happened here? What's going on that people are becoming so anxious all the time and where before maybe small trials or tribulations, which we all, of course, have to go through. It's part of life. That's the way it is. But they could be dealt with, but now it's it's a big deal, right? It stops you and you think, oh my God, what's going on? Where, where am I going to move forward? I think there's a level of uncertainty and I think that underpins what you're talking about right now. And I think that roadmap has been lost by so many of us. And I think what if I'm brutally honest about my intention in starting to write these articles, even before COVID, I could see a sea change in society that things were never going to be as they were. And I suddenly realised that homeopathy needs to take on a huge new burden, but we need to break through this impasse. There's an impasse. And um, now it's more than normal that particularly young people, they have mental health problems, they have anxiety. And 
we need to look at certain remedies. I found certain remedies, particularly from the periodic table, Lantanides remedies from Jan Shulton, deeper and darker remedies are more and more needed. So we need to adjust our lens to see people within that context because that has superimposed upon that underlying trauma which they carry from birth, etc. I just want to say, Elizabeth, you have an absolutely great mind, you know. I'm so happy that you're back on the show. Thank you. <laughs> oh, well, thank you very much for bringing out the best in us and um, appreciating our joint work because, as I say, getting that message across has been very, very difficult for us, but we feel already that we are making inroads and people are getting it. Mm. And you're really helping to put it out there. Would you agree, Nigel? Yeah, definitely. Um, and in some respects, you know, for me, what the book stands for is, is if you look around at society, if you look around at the world today, you can't uh, fail to be struck by um, the amount of uh, lack of trust in the systems and institutions that we've depended on, which seem to be falling around, falling apart around us. The um, uh, proliferation of fake and false information um, and, and the sheer amount of information that's um, impacting upon us and, and, and being demanded of us all the time is increasing at, at a rapid speeds. So the complexity of life is really increasing rapidly. And I think these are the sort of things that, that contribute to that underlying anxiety uh, that you mentioned, Atik. Mm. And I think, you know, with what's great is that is that homeopathy exists. So what, what I see Elizabeth as, and you know, she's she's the I'd say she's the homeopathic expert here. I'm certainly I wouldn't claim to be, but she she can see into remedies that already have been discovered and written about in the Materia Medicas, and she can interpret what those descriptions of those remedies are in a contemporary uh, time, like now, against the sort of things that I was talking about. So in a way, Elizabeth brings the payload of the book, and I, I'm the delivery system in the sense that I've well, helped to steer in That's your modest take on it, Nigel, but quite honestly, you've given it huge impetus. Yeah, I mean, yeah, we work together very well from because we have these complementary uh, skills, I'd say. Uh, it's a wonderful partnership indeed. So now talking about um, the book itself, of course, which is, uh, just as a reminder, Flourishing Against the Odds, Homeopathy for Our Rapidly Changing Worlds. And by the way, incidentally, it is available on Amazon. Um, you can uh, search for it on Amazon quite easily. And uh, I have to say the cover's really, really beautiful. And I mentioned this to Elizabeth as well when we spoke uh, a few weeks ago. But um, I'll, I, I won't explain or describe the cover to you. I think you should head over to Amazon and any other outlets, actually. I've just mentioned one available in all homeopathic bookstores, I'm quite sure. We're getting there. Um, Good. It's, av it's available um, in, in bookstores on, in the United States and, and the UK, and uh, we have a representative in Ireland. But I think it's on Amazon in about 11 countries, so that's that's another thing too. I think that's okay then. No, that's not too bad. <laughs> Can I just say that Nigel designed the cover? He must take credit for the cover. Oh, really? Okay. Well, again, I can't talk about it because it will spoil it for those who want to actually have a look at the book and purchase it. But um, I really, really like it. So that's, if it's worth anything, I don't know if it's worth anything at all, but I love it. I think it's brilliant. It's really eye-catching, you know? Thank you. There's so, been a lot of complimentary comments about that. Oh, wonderful. You better, you better patent that, I think. <laughs> uh, well, I can't claim it to be entirely of my own making, as I, I used an AI to create it. Uh, but uh, <laughs> it is my copyright. <laughs> and I think it's quite unusual for a homeopathy book to have such a cover. So let's let's leave it as uh, hanging in suspense there, shall we? <laughs> <laughs> now, there's three um, specific chapters uh, within the book. Uh, which caught my attention. The first one is gut health. The second was the, and this is just, just we have to pick a few, obviously, for for, for the show. Uh, every chapter is brilliant, but uh, gut health, 
caught my attention, the gut-brain axis. And something very important, the resurgence of narcissism, which I have a lot to say on myself personally as well. But I wanted to talk to about I wanted to talk to you about gut health actually to both of you. Um, Elizabeth, in episode thirty-eight, when you came on, uh, we spoke. You met. You spoke rather about autism. You spoke about the need for you know proper gut health, microbes, uh, microbiome, and etc. So do share your sort of uh, wisdom here on the importance of gut health. Research, uh, recent uh, scientific research has shown that um, a very large proportion of the immune cells actually reside in the colon. In fact, one of the studies um, said 80%. And that's absolutely huge. Of course it is. It's, it's massive, you know, because you've only got 20% on the other side. So what we eat is who we are, but it's not just about food, is it? It's about everything else that you've covered in this well, book. Well, it's a lot about absorption, isn't it? Mm. And um, I think we can't talk about the gut without talking about the vagus nerve because that's an important factor that's come to light. And, of course, the word vagus in Latin means wandering. And there is such a connection between the two, the brain and the gut, but most of the, the pathways go from the gut to the brain rather than the other way around. And that's an important factor. And one of the remedies we explore in the book, which I discovered before, is butyric acid. Hmm. which is an incredibly important remedy for the gut and helps the assimilation of vitamin D, etc. But it also has a very big picture of depression and anxiety, the issues you were talking about earlier. So it's amazing how these gut remedies often have a very big mental, emotional picture veering towards depression and dark mood and how they can enhance the treatment so much on that level. Um, Nigel, what about your uh, what are your insights on this? The importance of of gut health. Yeah, I think it's I think it's um, crucially important. I mean, the the gut is is also loaded with metaphors. We talk about gut feelings, for instance, uh, and 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 the gut itself. You know, if it, I don't as an engineer, I'd be interested to know what the surface area of the gut is. But I would imagine it is an extremely large surface area which means to my mind that it exposes us to whatever's going on outside of the body within as it were uh, in a very large way so if, if that surface area uh, is not is vulnerable to attack then one's going to suffer ill health right where it matters mm. and in fact you know that was one of the reasons why I first encountered Elizabeth. My gut suffered after working in in, in Bangladesh for two years, and and so I had to go to her to help me. And homeopathy, it was a revelation how it turned things around. Um, yeah, I mean, and and, and how that axis then is with the brain is really interesting because we talked about the gut brain axis, and uh, you know Elizabeth's far more uh, researched in this respect than me, but. I think if your guts are upset, you can't really think straight. That's how I would look at it. But it's very interesting because the gut-brain axis is actually formed at birth, along with the pituitary gland. So we already are vulnerable to how much we can digest in life from the day we're born. And I think one of the areas I'm particularly interested in, in now, and we touch on in the book, is the health of the embryo and what happens in the embryonic form. We so often take the case from day one, but actually there's so much more input into that very early embryonic life that we need to take on board. And once we do, we can see amazing results. And I've found with particularly autistic children that that aspect is so key. And um, I almost see autism as an embryonic disruption. And I think that once homeopaths extend their questioning right into that area of the person's life, they get to see so much more of the picture. It's interesting what, you, what you're saying, because I'm just thinking that how do you, over and above what, what you're doing already and that you teach as well, um, but... How do you really get this across? Because at the moment, everybody or the majority of people generally that we see, for example, are very stuck in a system 
and it's like uh, whatever whatever happens you know this is the first point of call how does one think outside of the conventional box to say well hang on who am i and, you know i was having this conversation actually with um, Jan Scholten we were talking about personalities and how different scenarios in your life and what you face can give you different personalities and these are not personalities as in i have to behave like this if i'm a son and if i'm a father i'm i'm different and as a husband or wife and wherever but it was just the fact that we change according to the people that we meet and we can't be ourselves and there's this whole mask um it's almost like becoming an actor and pretending to be something that we're not or pretending or wanting to be and how does one get people to realize there's more to us than just popping a pill literally if you're sick to recognize who we are what we're made of and how we can rectify the majority of problems that we may encounter actually as far as our health is concerned i think that goes back to the issue of connection you know um you, you remain yourself if you stay connected and in the, in the context of the gut uh, where the feelings are held and the uh, digestion and absorption of concepts and ideas takes place um it's really important to to have that that faculty provided by the uh, the intestinal health available to you to 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 remain you know i'd say um balanced so I think it's really important, and, and and the fact that the amount of pharmaceutical drugs that are consumed and the quality of the content of foods that are consumed uh, is going up and going down in you know in sequence in the sense that we're, we're take, people taking more drugs from the doctors and and they're eating more fast food and rubbish like that. So our guts are really under attack, and therefore I think that drives this um, lack of uh, connection with who we are. Yes, so it's a very, very important point, actually, that you've mentioned here, um, because we we don't feel with our mind, we feel with our heart, and we actually do feel with the gut. And this thing that you mentioned about gut instinct, it's real, but it's just not something tangible that can be measured, but it's there, you know, and um, it's a sensation, I mean, every scientist who perhaps um doesn't believe in 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 let's say we take an example of someone who doesn't believe in emotions but they always feel with their heart so how do you explain that how can you put that in it's it's an emotion isn't it it's a sensation and certainly the gut is a bit more physical here though because we eat we digest or sometimes in the majority of cases we don't digest properly how we're supposed to be and then we have all this uh Oh, mess, don't we, in our digestive tract because of the way that we are? How, how are we going to fix that? Uh... <laughs> I'd go beyond. I'd just just to cut in there, I'd go beyond saying um, that it's it's just a, a feeling or, or or whatever. It's 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 an intelligence. It's a microbial intelligence that we're only just starting to realise exists in other forms. You know, like mycorrhiza, for instance. This is a really this is a really fascinating area, and I think that the, the gut microbial environment provides us with a degree of intelligence. It's no it's no surprise to me that that there's a link to the brain, but I'll I'll let Elizabeth say more because she she knows more than I do about this. Well, sure. it's interesting recently that um, multiple sclerosis and Parkinson's has been very much attributed to the gut as the first port of call. So what do you think of diseases like that, particularly as homeopaths? We think of them as very syphilitic and very dark diseases, but actually we don't automatically think of them as stemming from gut disturbance. Mm. But it would be interesting to know how much shifts within that disease when you start looking at the gut and seeing how much that peels off the actual pathology. So the gut contributes to the pathology on a very dark and deep level way beyond what we so far have understood so we need to take that on board with remedies as i said like butyric acid which is really um, a game changer for me and when you combine it with other remedies particularly say in alzheimer's there's a remedy called nux muscata 
which is similar to alumina in its applicability. And it also contains butyric acid. But when you give, as an adjunct, butyric acid in lower dose, it really enhances the action, not just on the gut level, but on the brain level. So um, this is why I think it's a whole new area to explore for homeopaths and beyond. And it's something I'm incredibly interested to pursue. Wonderful. Will you also talk about <clears throat> uh, the resurgence of narcissism in this book? So I do share. <laughs> Nigel? Narcissism, um, nihilism, I think they're both uh, having a resurgence, to be honest with you. Um, <clears throat> I mean, part of the driver for narcissism, in my opinion, is, is the, the whole kind of social media side of things, um, which, uh, ironically, uh, is encouraged through uh, computer algorithms. Not, it's not as if people are pressing buttons so much at the other end encouraging us. It's the way in which the code is is produced in the first place to mm. drive that sort of surge of likes and dislikes, whatever you you know whatever you say or do. Um, <clears throat> but I think there's also a rise of nihilism too, in the sense that people are through the things that we've talked about already are starting to see in in many ways the breakdown of of, of normality uh, as it's uh, come to be known to us. Um, for whatever reason, um, and 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 I think that's that's sad, very sad. You know, it's 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 looking looking forward to death in a way. And it comes from the roots, doesn't it? Because there's lack of substance in the roots. There's lack of input. There's lots lack of oxytocin. Our book is very much focused on connection, oxytocin, and so on. And what I understand about narcissism is not so much the narcissist who suffers but those within the orbit of the narcissist mm -hmm. and I remember many years ago when I was starting to study narcissism I bought a book from a, a bookshop called Karnak which was specially for psychotherapists and I'll never forget this book I'm particularly interested in narcissism like Attic because quite a few people around me are mm -hmm. struggling with it mm -hmm. beyond their awareness and the first thing it said in this book about narcissism is that they represent the silent assassin. And for me, I'll never forget that because it went so deep. And when people talk about their parents or whoever, I mention the narcissist. And if I say anything about the silent assassin, it just cuts them to the quick. And it just makes sense. It speaks to them because there's no insight when it comes to a narcissist. And that's why they can assassinate without even one blink of an eye. Mm. And that's right. why it's so hurtful. And those around, often they're empaths and people who don't have that insight into their own vulnerability, but protect themselves through empathy, who have to survive this. And it really is quite a pathology. So staying with that subject, a narcissist, for example, a personality, narcissistic personality, being a narcissistic personality, how can one get through? That's very interesting because one will never present with that as mm. a symptom. Yeah. But maybe through addressing other issues, maybe even through the gut or for whatever they present with, that mm. can be taken on board by the homeopath and dealt with in the prescription so i think that we mustn't just screen it off as a one issue symptom there's always a connection they're always linked up yeah yeah you're absolutely right i think the narcissist doesn't exist in isolation by definition almost and 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 so eventually the narcissist will feel the derision of those around that see them as narcissists and their behavior Atik, and, and you were just discussing about how does the narcissist identify themselves as a narcissist? Well, they never will because that's that's what that's what narcissism is about. Exactly. Uh, <laughs> but other people, other people can feel and see it, and eventually, maybe the message will come back to them. Why am I living in isolation? <laughs> Why is no one listening to me? Why haven't Why? I got a target for my narcissism? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's uh, it's interesting. Um, 
But I, I was, you know, as you're <clears throat> as you're talking, I'm just thinking as well that, you know, you are right about saying that it's a result. There's always a cause and effect, you know. So there there has to be, and one can go back quite a bit actually with the, you know, the beauty of homeopathy to find out what what was the cause, and there may be multiple causes, of course, as well. But you know, something leading on from that as well, because certainly in this book you talk about uh, toxic environmental. Uh, pollution we of course the the mental and emotional fallout because lockdowns which you've mentioned climate change uh the uh, political de, de uh, distrust and um polarization do you find certainly i have observed certainly in the last several years that now more people have a much shorter fuse than they did previously everybody is very much on edge and it's just like saying the wrong thing and and you know there's this you you feel that people have become upset or angry i mean anger is i've encountered so many people who are angry and i said why are you angry said we don't know we're just angry and we don't know what to do about it and you know you're stuck because you're thinking what's wrong with me you know what happened so do, do you think do, it goes do, back, Attic, to that whole thing we're talking about, where people don't feel they have control, that their power has gone? Mm. And I feel that's their way of expressing it. Frustration. Mm. Yeah, I think there's a lot to do with frustration. I think, I think, you know, the evolution of, of humans has taken millions of years, and yet what we're doing as a result of, of blossoming the way we have is changing the world around us in, at such a pace that our evolutionary capacity is outpaced by what, by the changes occurring around us. Now that's a recipe for frustration on a really big scale. And when people are frustrated that they can't grasp the 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 the, the, the speed of change and the things that they have to do to respond to it. Uh, they're going to get angry. And we go back to the organon, don't we, the aphorism, health is the ability to adapt to changes. And I think that's one of the reasons why we wrote the book, because actually we're so severely challenged on all fronts when it comes to that aphorism. Life has changed so much since that whole uh, ideal came about. So now we really need to navigate this new roadmap. Something interesting has, has occurred as well, which was that with social media, first they were feeds, um, first they were papers, let's go back to that, you know, newspapers, lengthy articles, we've all had the Times, you know, massive pages, isn't it, like wallpaper, you could put them up, so huge, got smaller and smaller, of course, fantastic mobile technology, news became shorter and shorter in chunks, and now let's take some uh, video uh, let's say people who watch, you know, some of the videos that are out there, and or bite-sized news, for want of a better word, um, it it reduced from three minutes to two minutes, one hour, thirty seconds. But now I've actually come across people who are like, we don't have thirty seconds. Just tell me what happens. Tell me the facts in like bullet points. So, oh, it opens with a screen. Somebody gets punched, and and that's it. And they're happy with that. That's yeah. quite worrying because, I mean, is that good? <laughs> that can't be good for our brain. I know we're living in a, a fast-paced society for a myriad of reasons, but wow, you know, what's next? I don't want to know, I guess, isn't it? Because there's nothing left. Well, I mean, you've only got to look at the uh, success of um, an app like Twitter to reinforce the point that you're making. You know, the news in 140 syllables or 140 characters or whatever the limit of a tweet is. Hmm. <laughs> I think we're going to have to draw ourselves up back from the brink at some point. We're going to. And when you talk about war and the idiocy of war when the globe is already under threat, I mean, it's mind bending. It's mind blowing. It's um, there's no joined up thinking. And when you come, when you talk about narcissists, I kept on thinking about the leaders who were governing these wars. If you boil it all down, don't you think narcissism plays a huge role? Is it for their survival and their reputation? What else can it be for? 
this is what exasperates me and what drives me to do the work I try to do because I feel if we can make 1% of difference somewhere, something's got to break through. I, I, what you've said is very profound. I mean, it's, it's a lack of empathy. There's a lack of, in, there's injustice, which is a lack of justice itself. And it's very much a survival of the fittest, you know, and it doesn't matter who may get bulldozed in the process, sadly, you know. Um, I, I hear stories which sometimes are quite traumatic and it just shows you that sometimes there's places on earth, you know, I say it like this because with life has no value, you know, it doesn't matter to take somebody's life and wow you know what stage must one be in to be able to i know we're going we're going off slightly the the subject matter but it just makes me think to take a life and and you know we're talking about families we're talking about children we're to, i mean wherever you are you know this it's wow I, did, I i have no words actually because it's just it just makes you think doesn't it what have we got ourselves into i mean talk about digging ourselves a grave how are we going to get out of this you know what a mess absolute mess you know that's why we've got to flourish against the odds that's mm. why we've got to fight to bring homeopathy <laughs> into the modern sphere because homeopathy is not perceived in the way it's written about in this book and i think this is where it's cutting edge and it's useful and i think it gives people empowerment to know there is a way and they can take stock of their own lives and contextualize it according to who they really are, find their authenticity and spread that around through their treatments and through their influences with other people. Yeah, I agree with that. Yeah. I, mean, I, I, think, I think the book, for me, the book is, is a tool of reconnection. You know, if it's, if it's used and, and, and the information that um, is inside it is used in, as... as um, as intended by homeopaths and, and by practitioners from even other modalities, um, then it's a tool of reconnection. And we live, we live in a world that, that was designed to be deeply networked and interconnected. So we're only going to face trouble if we, if we treat it as if it's not connected to us in some way, which is basically why things are going the way they're going. And I think the book, therefore, is is designed to help people to to reconnect to that to themselves, to them, to each other, and, and and to the environment around them, and from which health, from which flourishing, uh, should hopefully come about. This is a great conversation. I'm loving it. Now on to the book, specifically remedies. So do share some of the remedies that you've covered. I mean, I I, I can just flick through as well, just for for those who are wondering. Uh, there are a number of very, very good remedies, including uh, saccharum, uh, including uranium, nit uh, uranium nitricum, uh, vanadium, and uh, and many, many more, uh, veritrum album, and so forth. So do share some of the remedies that um, are very timely at this moment that you sort of mentioned in the book as far as flourishing and uh, actually to give real hope because there's real hope in homeopathy. And when I mean real hope, I mean it's not just hope, it follows through. Can I just talk about vanadium, actually? Because um, somebody I know who works in one of the homeopathic pharmacies received a copy of our book, and she just started flicking through it, and she said to me, you know, I got stuck on the page about vanadium. And she said it completely changed my mind about that remedy, and I saw it in such a different context. And she was very grateful for the book just for that entry. And vanadium, I think, is incredibly fitting when you think about parents who often through their own thwart their own thwarted ambition, they project a lot of ambition onto their children, which could be seen as slightly narcissistic. But for those children, it's not really who they are or what they want to excel in, but they're pushed into this path of perfectionism. And I think perfectionism is um, an impossible zeal anyway. But when children are pushed that way, they enter this pathology. And vanadium is a very destructive remedy. And often the outcome is an eating disorder it can be anorexia, bulimia, etc. But um, I think it fits very much with the zeitgeist of modern parenting when there is this hugely competitive aspect. Um, again, without 
respecting the individuality or needs of that child. And again, it comes back to Jan Scholten and the periodic table. He's the person who put that remedy out there. And it has huge meaning for this world we're now living in, I think. Um, what about you, Nigel? Well, I mean, I, I'm, I'm not a practicing homeopath now, so I should defer uh, this part of the conversation to Elizabeth. <laughs> but I will mention three remedies, which um, I, uh, I particularly have favor, a favor for, if you like. Um, Proteus, we mentioned Proteus in the book, of course. Uh, it's a gut remedy again, uh, so there's no surprises there. Um, very uh, keen on the bowel nosodes uh, for, for the reasons we've talked about. Picric acid, uh, picricum acid, um, helping us to make sense of the speedy world in which we live in. You know, it's 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 a real. I used picric acid when I was doing. Uh, exams in my master's degree and, and and it really helped so I have insight into how that can help you catch up speed up you know and get on on board with what's going on around and and then symbolically uranium nitricum another uh, remedy if I'm not mistaken that Jan Cholton brought to our attention amazing you know it's just symbolic of the world we live in so say no more but mm. I, Elizabeth's got the knowledge as I said I'm not really up on that side of things I just want to say about Proteus, um, they talk about it representing the state of siege. And when you think about what's happening in the world today, we all feel somewhat under siege by what's going on. And I think it's an incredibly important stepping stone remedy when we're going through through those very acute states. And I use it with great purpose and intention with good results, I must say. Wonderful. And do tell us about plutonium because... Um, it's the talk of the town at the moment, as far as homeopathy is concerned. Well, that's a remedy. When I read about it years ago, I thought, gosh, that's going to stay in the Materia Medica. But now it just comes out of every pore from so many of my clients. And um, it's a nihilism. There's a sense of um, that life has been negated. There's no, Everywhere you look, there's doom and gloom. And it's very hard to break through that. And often there's a war situation in the background of that family. They've never adapted to living in peaceful zones. Um, but I think it's probably representing a new miasm, definitely. It's a very heavy, dark energy associated with it. And radioactive, um, of course. Yeah, it's a fissile material. You know, it's it's on the spectrum with uranium. So, yeah. Yes. Wonderful, wonderful indeed. So, um, moving on from the book, um, are you going to actually, as a light hearted question, are you going to have a sequel to the book? Is there going to be volume two and three and four, maybe? Because I think um, this is something that's here to stay with the changing world that we're living in. Yeah, <laughs> I, can see, I, I, I can see, I can see, I can see there's an opportunity there. Um, and it would be uh, dependent on developing the themes in the book because, yes, no one book can, can cover this, everything that's happening at the moment. Hmm. Uh, Elizabeth? We are, we are keeping records of what's going on now and we're filing them with that in mind, with the possibility of pursuing it, but um, only as an idea at this moment. Would you agree, Nigel? Yes, that's, I, I would agree with that exactly. And I think having having gone through the process of learning how to self-publish, which was no mean feat alongside, you know, writing the, the thing with Elizabeth, yeah, I'm hoping that next time it will be easier, that side of things at least, and that um, having had the experience of working together in such an intense way that we, we, we will be able to, if we were to do it, produce something with less blood, sweat and tears perhaps. <laughs> I must mention to those uh, listening, the book does, because we mentioned about remedies, so um, it does have a uh, Materia Medica with selected homeopathic remedies. So um, it's really, really important there as well. And this includes, of course, the remedies that we've just touched upon. Um, what's the future for you, Elizabeth? What are you doing next? What are you working on for the late latter part of this year? That's an interesting one, isn't it? Hmm. Well, reco recovering. Um, 
and also digesting what we've done and realizing that maybe I have a role to perpetuate that work through my clients, not necessarily through writing. I may odd, add the odd article um, on my website. There's some revelations that are coming to me now, but I don't have any fixed plans per se. I'm very open. I have been working in Italy recently. I could return there and talk about the book and also in France. But as I say, I'm, I'm quite fluid at the moment. And uh, what about yourself, Nigel? Well, I, I, I'm operating in, in, a, in a world of uh, decarbonisation and, and all of that kind of stuff, trying to help cities meet the carbon commitments that our government have made. Mm. Um, but in terms of homeopathy, I mean, I, I, in a way, it depends on Elizabeth's articles. I'm, I'm trying to keep Elizabeth's articles under the wrap. She's, she's a prolific writer. And um, and I think those articles we could forge into an extension of the book, maybe a second edition or something like that. Um, the world will, will will certainly not fail to present us with uh, topics to write about mm. as long as our eyes remain open to what's the changes happening around us. And I think that's that's the key, really, is is to is to tune into what's going on and see where what needs to be said about it from a homeopathic perspective and where homeopath homeopathy can can play a role and help people navigate the pace of change i think topicality i think homeopathy needs to be brought into this age really and that's what we've set out to do i think and i think you've done an absolutely incredible job um so again uh, the book is called Flourishing Against the Odds, Homeopathy for Our Rapidly Changing World. Um, for students, homeopaths, and anyone interested in homeopathy, uh, please do take a look at it. You know, it's a very timely book. Uh, it's, it's a very, let me rephrase, it's a very timely book um, for the times that we're currently living in. Um, Elizabeth Adalian and Dr. Nigel Hargreaves, absolute pleasure to have you on the show. And uh, thank you so very much for coming on and, and sharing and talking about the book and your insights. Thank you. Thank you, Atik. I do hope you've enjoyed this week's episode of the Homeopathy Health Show. Please do support the show by clicking follow on my socials. Remember, the more exposure the podcast receives, the better for homeopathy around the world. You can find me on Instagram by searching for at like underscore treats like and on both Facebook and TikTok by searching for at Like Treats Like. So let's promote the voice of homeopathy on radio and podcast around the world together. Don't forget to visit me online at www.liketreatslike.co.uk and click on the radio and podcast tab. Here you'll be able to see all the guests that have joined me on the show so far. And of course, you can stream on demand the latest episode to your mobile, tablet or PC. Until next time, stay safe and take care.